Hi there and welcome to another video for the AQA Linear uh, GCSE paper. In this video I will work through practice paper 1, the non-calculator practice paper 1 paper. Okay, let's start straight away. Here's a question. How many terms are there in the expression 2x plus 3f subtract 5? Well, the answer I will tell you is actually 3. And I will tell you some potentially wrong answers. Okay, so, so some potentially wrong answers are 5 and 7. Now, a term in algebra. 2x is a term. 3f is a term. And 5 is a term. Hence, the answer is 3. Now, the plus here, that's a, an operation. It's not a term. And the subtract here is an operation and not a term. So hence, um, it is not 5, okay, and also it's not 7 because some people think the 2 is also a term, but it's not. The 2 is combined with the x, it's 2x, there's one term. 3 and f, they're not two separate terms, they're one term, there's the second term. And 5 is on its own as a term. So the terms here, there are three terms. Next question. Join each box on the left with a matching box on the right. One has been done for, for you. This here is an expression because it has uh, algebra, letters, uh, numbers and operations in it. But it has no equal sign, so it's clearly an expression. Now an equation is the easiest one. An equation is something with an equal sign that you can solve. So these two have an equal sign. Can Which one can you solve for x or n or whatever the variable is? Well, this one because clearly you could solve that by subtracting 2 off both sides and dividing by 3. x would be 3 in this case, so this is an equation. Now an identity is something that where the left hand side and the right hand side are true for any uh, variables in the particular expression. So here, this here is an identity, because no matter what x I choose, if I choose x to be 0 or a million, both sides of this identity are always the same. Three lines also is a giveaway for an identity. And the formula, the last one, is clearly this one here. Now, a formula uh, tends to be an equation. It has an equal sign, but it has more than one variable. It, in this case, we have V, L, B, and W. We have four variables, and it's a way of calculating. In this case, it looks like the volume is the length times the breadth times the width. That's what it seems to me to be a, 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 a formula for. So there's a formula. Okay, next question. A sensor records the temperature at 7 a.m. It then records the temperature every three hours. Another sensor records the air pressure at 8 a.m., then records the air pressure every four hours. At what times in a 24-hour period will the two sensors take this reading at the same time? Okay, so this is a, a, a case of finding out lowest common multiples. The easiest ways to do it is by listing out. So let's be very careful how we lay out our work in. Let's do the um, temperature. So the temperature sensor. Okay, the first time it does it's at 7 a.m. Okay, and it does it every three hours, so it'll do it at 10. The next time after that will be 1 p.m., 4 p.m., 7 p.m., um, 10 p.m., and then it would be 1 a.m., so I should probably write a, a p here, p, 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 1 a.m., 4 a.m., and it's back at 7 a.m., that's a 24-hour period, right? Okay, and then let's do the pressure sensor. So if we list that out, it starts at 8 a.m. and it does every four hours. So the next one will be 12, and the next one after that will be 4 p.m., and it'll be 8 p.m., and it will be uh, 12 a.m. again. So this would be peak. So it would be 12 a.m. the next one, and 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. And which times are they the same? Well, it's just a case of highlighting the same ones. Okay, so when are they the same? It looks like 4 p.m. they're the same. Any other time we can uh, work out where they're the same. It seems that at 4 a.m. they are also the same. Okay, so the answer, therefore, that we need to state is 4 p.m. and 4 a.m. And that's quite an easy three marks. It's basically just listing. 
Okay, question three. Um, a student shows activities on a trip. A table shows activities on a trip. Each student chooses two activities. Twice as many boys as girls choose rock climbing. Two more boys choose archery than choose horse riding. Five times more girls choose horse riding than archery. How many students on the trip altogether? Again, you should find a question like this very, very straightforward, and it's five marks. So let's read out each fact. Twice as many boys, twice as many boys as girls choose rock climbing. Now, eight girls choose rock climbing, so therefore 16 boys, twice as many, must choose rock climbing. And we've done with that fact. Two more boys choose archery than choose horse riding. So two more boys choose archery than boys choosing horse riding. Now, 10 boys chose horse riding, so therefore 12 boys must choose archery. That fact has been dealt with. And five times more girls choose horse riding than choose archery. Archery was four girls, so therefore 20, five times as many, choose that. And then uh, finally, how many students are there on the trip altogether? Well, all you've got to do is add 8 plus 16 plus 20 plus 10 plus 4 plus 12. Now, obviously, you don't have a calculator here. Don't mock up some simple um, addition here. 8 at 16, I would do it in steps just to make life easier. 8 at 16 is 24. 20 add 10 is 30. And 4 add 12 is 16. Then I would add the 16 and the 24. That makes it very easy. That makes it 40. And 40 plus 30 is equal to 70. Now, be very careful at this stage. You've got to think to yourself, that was an easy question for five marks. Now, just read the initial question here. The table shows activities, the students on the trip. Each student chooses two. So if in total there are 70 in this box, each student has been recorded twice, therefore the number of students is 70 divided by 2, which is equal to 35. Okay, so be very careful. Not many students will get that last mark because they will misread the start of the question. And so that's why it's very important to label your questions at the start. Next question. A teacher gave her, her student a test. The test is out of 30 marks, the stem and leaf, leaf diagram shows the results. What percentage of students scored more than 80% or more? Well, firstly, there's four marks for this. Let's work out what 80% of a test of 30 is. So what is 80% of 30? Okay, well that's the same as 0 0.8 times 30, and that should be easy for you to work out. That should simply be 24. You should be able to work that out because 8 times 3 is 24 and 0 0.8 times 30 is therefore 24. So we're looking for scores that are 24 or more because it says 80% or more. So 24 is an included score. So who got 24? They did. They got 25, 28. So there are three. And out of how many kids are there? There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in total, you can see that there are 20 kids. So therefore, um, it's 3 out of 20. So what? it's 3 out of 20, um, which if you want to work it out as a percent, you times top and bottom by 5, it would be 15 out of 100, which tells you the answer is clearly 15%. And you're done. Next, you ask to expand 5, brackets x plus 5. You should find something like this, very simple. It's just, let's bring that down here, 5 times x plus 5 times 5. So it's 5x plus 25. Be very careful not to write 5x plus 5. Lots of students forget to distribute the multiplying by 5 over the two terms. That is not correct. Next question, factorise the following. Well, doing the above part should help you. What goes into x squared and 6x? What divides into those? Well, x does. And then divide out the x, or factorise out the x. x squared divided by x is x. And 6x plus 6x divided by x is simply plus 6. And you're done. 
x is an odd number for 5 part c. We're told it's odd. Complete these sentences using one of the following. The expression 5 multiplied by x plus 5 is, and you have to say, is it always even, always odd, or either odd or even? And lastly, the expression x squared plus 6x. Okay, let's think about this. If you have an odd number, it, let, let's look at this first. Um, the two ways of doing it. If x is odd, okay, five is certainly an odd. Okay, so you're adding an odd to it, and an odd plus an odd always gives you an even, doesn't it? Think about that. An odd plus an odd gives you an even. Think of some examples if you're not sure. Seven plus nine is eighteen. Um, three plus five is equal to 8. So an odd plus an odd is an even. So this bit here, just this bit here, is an even number. And 5 multiplied by an even number, or an even number multiplied by anything is even. So therefore, it's always even. OK, now let's do the next part. Let's think along the same lines here. X is uh, odd. Now, here, x squared plus 6x, um, there are two ways to do it. Let's use the factorised version. We know that this is equal to x, x plus 6, right? Now, if we know x is odd, that's odd. An odd plus 6, which is an even, an odd plus an even is always odd. That is a fact, okay? And an odd multiplied by an odd... Think of these, an odd times an odd, let's say um, 5 multiplied by 3, that is 15, or 3 multiplied by 7 is 21, or something like 9 multiplied by 5 is 45. An odd multiplied by an odd is always an odd. So therefore, the answer for this is actually always odd. What if you hadn't used the factorised version? Would you have been able to get the answer still? Well, you could have thought to yourself, if you were just thinking of the x squared, that's odd times odd, so that must be odd. And then you've got a 6x. Well, 6 times an odd, uh, an even times an odd is an always an odd. And if you add an odd and an odd, uh, think about it, 3 plus... Sorry, 6 times 5 must be even, what am I saying? Because an even times anything is even. And an odd and an even clearly add up... Um, as for example, an odd and an even clearly add up to give you an odd. Okay, so that's a different way of doing it. I think the factorised way is the easiest, and you're supposed to use the part above to make your life easier. Next question. In a wood, half of the trees are oak. 30% of the trees are sycamore, the rest are elm. Write the ratio of oak to sycamore to elm. Give your answer in the simplest form. Okay, let's just call, let's use a bit of algebra here. In a wood, half of the trees are oak. So let's say, um, let's say for example, um, the number of trees in the wood is x. Okay, so half of them are oak, so 0 0.5 multiplied by x are oak. And 30% of them are sycamore, so 0 0.3x are sycamore. The rest are elm, so therefore it must be 0.2x are elm. And to, you have to write a ratio, and it has to be whole numbers. So you're going for oak to sycamore to elm, 0 0.5 to 0 0.3 to 0 0.2, which simplifies simply to 5 to 3 to 2. Like that. It's got to be whole numbers in a ratio. One-fifth of the oak trees and half of the sycamore trees are cut down. Work out the new ratio uh, of the number of oak to sycamore to elm, Give your answer in the simplest form. So let's go back to what it was before. Um, oak to sycamore to elm was 5 to 3 to 2. Okay, or it was actually 50% of the trees to 30% of the trees to 20% of the trees. Right? Now, one fifth of the oak trees. Uh, are cut down. So one fifth of these are gone. 
So a fifth of 50% must be 10% and that's totally given away. So therefore, um, this has gone down to 40% of the trees in the wood. Um, and then half of the sycamores are knocked down. So half of these are knocked down. So you're only left with 15 now. Okay. And you're still left with what you had before the 20 here. So that is now your ratio. And if you simplify this, divide everything by, let's say, 5, you'd get 8 to 3 to 4 would be your new ratio, 8 to 3 to 4. Okay? 7a, solve this equation. Very easy for three months. You should be lapping up questions like this. Let's add 3 to both sides, first of all. Be very careful with minuses. 10x, therefore, would be 4x. You've got minus 12 plus 3. You're minus 12 on the number line and you add 3 and you so, you, so you get negative 9 or minus 9. Then let's subtract 4x from both sides. So you get 6x is equal to negative 9. And then you divide both sides by 6 and you get x is negative 9 over 6. And dividing top and bottom by 3, you would get x is negative 3 over 2 or 1.5. Now before you go on, check your answer. Please, please, please check your answer to know you haven't made a silly mistake. 10 times negative 1.5 is negative 15. Subtract 3 must be negative 18. So that's what you know that side is. Now, 4 times 1.5 uh, is 6. And 4 times negative 1.5 is negative 6. Subtract the 12 is also negative 18. Both sides are the same. You know you've got that right and you don't have to check it again. Uh, next question. Solve the following equation. So we've got 5 over 6, uh, D plus 1 and 3 quarters, uh, 5 over 6 plus D is equal to 1 and 3 quarters. Okay, first let's just change everything, everything to a fraction. Okay, uh, a normal fraction. So 5, 6 plus D is equal to, this is a fraction, must be 7 over 4. Okay? Um, because you've got 1 and 3 quarters. If you're not sure where that came from, 1 is 4 over 4, 3 quarters is that. If you add them together, you get 7 over 4, right? Or a quick way to do it is 1 times 4 plus the 3, 7 over 4. Now, you've got that there. Therefore, subtracting 5 over 6 of both sides, D must be 7 over 4, subtract 5 over 6, okay? And you can't subtract fractions or add them until the denominators are the same. They both go into 12. So let's multiply this one. I'm going to times this one by 3. So times the bottom by 3. And I'm going to times this one by 2. So I times both by 2. So therefore, I would get 21 over 12. Subtract a 10 over 12, which simply works out to D is therefore 11 over 12 and write that in your answer box, and you're done for three easy marks. Okay, next question. Three friends are talking about regular polygons. Uh, Allison says the exterior angle of a regular polygon is 72. A regular decagon has twice as many sides as a pentagon, so the exterior angles must be 72 divided by 2, says Colin. And a regular dec decagon has twice as many sides as a polygon, uh, so the exterior angle must be 2 multiplied by 72, says Ben. Is Ben or Colin correct? Tick the correct answer. You must show your work in. So uh, presumably, we can therefore assume that Alison is correct. Okay? And so we must uh, work out whether Colin or Ben is correct. Well, let's just... You know what? If we're unsure, let's just draw a picture. Let's draw a shape with five sides, one, two, three, four. It's regular, isn't it? So sorry, I'll delete, just give me one second here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a pentagon, maybe it's not regular, but there's the idea of a pentagon, okay? And what is Ben and Colin saying? Ben is saying, the, we're talking about exterior angles here. So the exterior angles, are these angles. 
Now let's just think about this. If we extended the sides here, say if we made this a 10 sided shape, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Imagine I made that a 10 sided shape now. Now, Im and imagine it was regular. Now the exterior angles here, what would happen to these exterior angles is the question. Well, maybe my picture is not doing it justice here, but the exterior angles would decrease because exterior angles sum to 360. Okay? Now, um, the exterior of five-sided shape must be equal to 360 divided by 5. Okay? And 360 divided by 5 is equal to 72. As Alison says. So the exterior of 10-sided shape well, they still add up to 360, but this time you share them out amongst 10. So they must be 36 degrees. Therefore, they halve. So, Colin is correct. So you must tick Colin. Um, and as long as you've got uh, that a decagon has 10 sides in here, then you get the mark and you state it must be smaller for this reason, you would get all three marks. It's very straightforward there. So the key rule, you need to know this, um, exterior angles of any polygon always add up to 360. And that's a rule you need to learn. Next question. Here is the rule for continuing this sequence. Multiply the previous term by 2 and subtract 1. Here's part of the uh, sequence that follows the rule. Work out the first and fifth terms. Well, to get from one term to the other, you multiply by 2 and subtract 1. So let's get from here to here. Let's multiply by 2 and you get 26. Then subtract 1 and you get 25. Now, what number went from here to here? Okay, you could work it out forwards. Or what you could do is, you could go backwards. What's the opposite of multiplying by 2? And subtracting 1 that way, well the opposite must be to add 1 first and then halve it. So add 1 and you get 5 and then halve it you get 2.5. And let's check it works going forward. 2.1 times 2 is 5, subtract 1 is 4, got it. So the first term is 2.5 and the fifth term is 25. Here is a different sequence, work out the nth term. So we're asked for two marks to work out the nth term of a sequence. Okay, the first thing to notice is they're going up in threes. Now, what else do you know goes up in threes? The three times tables, okay, which are three, six, nine, twelve, uh, fifteen, and the nth one must be five n. Uh, sorry, three n. Right. How do these two link? Well, they're the same as each other, apart from this one is one more than that one. So therefore, the nth term of this sequence must be 3n is the 3 times tables, but it's plus 1. So 3n plus 1 is our answer. Okay, next question, question 10. The diagram shows a right angle triangle ABC. AC is 50 centimetres. Let's write that in. 50 centimetres is already there for us. Angle ACB... A, C, B, this one here is X. You're told sine X is 24 over 25, cos X is 7 over 25, tan X is 24 over 7. Calculate the length of B, C. Okay, there are a couple of ways of doing this for three marks. Let's um, firstly just... Um, let's stick with what we know the normal way. We know Sokotara, right? And in this case, we are trying to work out the length of BC, 
which if we label it is equal to the adjacent and we have the hypotenuse okay so therefore we know we need to use ca and we would write down that cos of the angle x must be a over h and we would substitute in and we would get cos of, but we know cos of x is 7 over 25 we're told so 7 over 25 we're told cos of x here cos of the angle we're given that we're not given the angle we're given cos of the angle and that is equal to a over 50 so therefore a must be 7 over 25 multiplied by 50 which you should recognize as 14 okay and um, because 25 cancels here and here and it would be 7 times 2 which is 14 so that's one way of doing it, it's 14 centimetres. Probably the most straightforward way. The difference with this question here, usually you're given the angle, here you were given cos of the angle, just to complicate things ever so slightly. The other way of, uh, of thinking of it, really, is to say, well, cos of the angle x means op uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, right? And you are told that this fraction is 7 over 25. Okay, now clearly your hypotenuse is not 25, is it? It's 50. So this is an equivalent fraction to this. It must be because they're equal. So what to make that 50, I would have to times the top and the bottom by 2. So it would be 14 over 50, right? So cos x it is 7 over 25, which is the same as 14 over 50. But that makes the hypotenuse correct. And therefore, the adjacent must be correct, and the adjacent must be a 14. Perhaps a slightly more confusing way of doing it, so stick to the other way. Depends which you like. Question 11. Beth buys concert tickets for two adults and one child, costing £63. So, let's. Um, this is five marks. You get marks for how you write. So, let... Define your variables to start. Let A equal cost for adult. And let C equal cost for child. And let's write some equations down. Two adults and one child cost 63. So two adults plus one child cost 63 pounds. Jane buys concert tickets, three adults and two children. So three adults plus two children is £101. Uh, label them equations one and two. Sean has £60. He wants to buy two tickets for one adult and three children. He wants to buy tickets for one adult and three children. Does he have enough money? Okay, so the, probably the easiest way to do this is to solve these two equations for the cost for an adult and the cost for a child and then uh, substitute them into Sean's and see if he has enough. Now, how could we do, solve these equations? The easiest way is probably to multiply that one by two to make the number in front of the C, the coefficient of C, the same. It's probably the easiest. You could multiply this by three and this by two to make them both 6A, or you could just spot that this would be one move. If you did that, you would get 4A plus 2C is equal to 126. That would be equation three. And maybe just dot that one out for now, just to tell yourself that you've used it. Now, what you might do then is take away equations. So do equation 3, subtract equation 2. This one, take away this one. 4a take away 3a is a. 2c take away 2c is nothing. 126 take away 101 is equal to 25. So it looks like a is equal to 25. If you substitute back in this one, let's say 2a is 50. So 50 plus C is 63. C must be equal to 13. Now, let's deal with Sean's problem. Sean wants to buy one adult and three children. So that would be 25 plus 3 times 13, which would be 25 plus 39. And 25 and 39 is 64, which is bigger than 60 pounds he has. So the answer is no. He is how much short? Let's say six pounds short. And you're done. Sorry, four pounds short. Four pounds short. Sorry, 64 is bigger than 60. He is four pounds short. 
and there you go, you're done. Nice easy question, five marks, it's difficult to go wrong there, very straightforward. Okay, next question. Okay, next question. A shape is made from a semicircle and an isosceles triangle. Let's make sure that we label that. Let's make sure we label that this is a semicircle, this is an isosceles triangle. The height of the triangle is four centimeters. The diameter of the semicircle is six. Therefore, let's immediately label in the radius must be three. Work out the perimeter of the shape. Give your answer in terms of pi. Okay, the perimeter of the shape, let's draw it in. It must be this plus this. We're doing perimeter, not area. And then plus that, mustn't it? And we want to give our answer in terms of pi. Now, there's four marks to this question. We firstly need to know this distance here, which I'll call h. Now, how would we find h? We know this is 4, this is 3. Oh, look, we have a right angle triangle. So let's explain to the examiner clearly what we're doing. We want to work out h. And we know that's 4, 3. What's h? Well, we're using Pythagoras. You should know h is 5 automatically. You know a 3, 4, 5 triangle. But just to spell it out, h squared must be 3 squared plus 4 squared. h squared is therefore 25 h is therefore 5 centimetres. Okay, so we've got that bit. So we know that would be 5 and that would be 5. So we could label those in just to make our life easier. That's 5 and that's 5. So we know that this distance is 10. All we need is the blue distance now. So um, this distance here would be equal to, well, a whole circle is 2 pi r. So half a circle must be pi r, right? And r in this case is 3, don't be careful not to use 6, so therefore this must be 3 pi. So if we want to work out the total perimeter, the perimeter is therefore 5 plus 5 plus 3 pi, which is 10 plus 3 pi. You are asked to leave your answer in terms of pi, so make sure you do, and make sure you do not decimalise it. Question 13, love circle theorem questions, they're very straightforward. A, B, C, D are points on the circumference of a circle, centre O, angle A, C, D, A to C to D is 50. Okay, write down the value of X. Well, look, angles coming out of the same arc are always the same. So this X must be sim simply equal to 50. The reason angles from same arc are equal. Write down the value of angle y. Well, this is a very straight walk forward. Well, remember, angle at centre is double angle at uh, edge. Okay, so this angle here is double that angle, so it must be 100 degrees. And then just write angle at centre, double angle at circumference. Simple as that. Next part. Supposed to be slightly harder, 13b, PQRS are points on another circumference of a circumference of another circle. Very important here, we're dealing with another circle. XY is tangent to the circle P. This is a tangent touching a chord. You should be thinking alternate segment theorem. Which theorem states that angle YPS, look, Y to P to S, this angle here, call it YPS, is equal to PQS, P to Q to S. This angle here is PQS. Well, the angle that states that is called the alternate segment theorem. And just to be clear here what that means, I'm going to rub this out. It tells you, okay, that when a tangent touches a chord, okay, the angle the tangent makes with the chord is equal to the opposite angle in the triangle formed, okay, is equal to the opposite angle in the triangle formed. So just to make it clear, this angle here, 54, well that must be equal 
to uh, this angle over here, that must be equal to 54, just to make it clear. And this angle must be equal to that angle there. It must also, out of interest, be equal to that angle there, because that is a triangle made from the same chord, so it must also equal that angle there. Work out the uh, val and value of angle QPS. So QPS, let's just write in QPS. Where's Q? Q to P to S. We want to work out this here, QPS. Now, you know YPS. You know that YPS, we've just said, is equal to um, 48 by the alternate segment theorem, 48 degrees alternate segment theorem. So therefore, uh, these lines, straight lines, so QPS, QPS must therefore be equal to 180, subtract 54, subtract 48. So 180, subtract 54, subtract 48 would be 78 degrees. And you're done. Okay, next question, question 14. These letters are placed in a hat. A-A-R-D-V-A-R-K, aardvark. A letter is drawn from the hat at random, noted and replaced. Very important. The letter is put back. Another letter is then drawn from the hat at random. Complete the tree diagram. The probability of getting an A is 1, 2, 3 out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 3 out of 8. Not an A is therefore clearly 5 out of 8. Because it's replaced, none of these change the next time round. So the second letter is still 3 out of 8, 5 out of 8, 3 out of 8, 5 out of 8. Probably the easiest one mark on the whole paper. Work out the probability that exactly one of the two letters drawn is an A. So this is where you fill in your um, diagram here. So this here, this branch and this branch would be both A's. This branch and this branch would be A, not A. This branch and this branch would be not A, A. And this branch and this branch would be not A, not A. Now you want the probability of exactly one A. So these two combined. So this one and this one must be 3 8 times 5 8, which is 15 over 64. And this one must be 5 8 times 3 8 which would be 15 over 64. So going back to this question here, it would be 15 over 64 plus 15 over 64, which would clearly be 30 over 64. And if you simplified it, it would be 15 over 32. And you can say, look at tree diagram for working. Because it's easier, you see, to do the workings on the tree diagram as it is looking at this side of the page. Okay, next, work out the answer to this. Give your answer in the form a number, a whole number, plus some lots of, of, of a third. So this here is just multiplying out brackets and being very careful when you do that. Root th 2 plus 3 multiplied by root 2 plus 5. Let's just do what we do with algebra. Root 2 times root 2 is root 4, which is 2. Root 2 times the root 2 squared must be 2. Root 2 times 5 must be 5 root 2. Change pens. Positive 3 times root 2 must be plus 3 root 2. And positive 3 times positive 5 is plus 15. Now 2 plus 15 is 17. And plus 5 root 2 plus 3 root 2 must be plus 8 root 2. The answer is in the form a plus something at root c. It's 17 plus 8 root 2. Your a here is 17, you see. And your b is 8. And your c is the number underneath the square root is 2. Next question. <clears throat> A test is marked out of 50 marks. The box plot shows the distribution of marks. 60% of the students pass the test. Estimate the pass mark. You must show your working. Right. This is actually quite a tricky question. But it's only tricky if you just look at a 
box and whisker plot and expect it to be the usual type of question. If you use your brain and remember what a box and whisker plot is about, it's not hard at all. Let's just firstly, before we get into the detail, let's just state what each bit means. 10 marks is the lowest mark scored on the test. 50 marks, someone actually scored full marks. That's the highest mark. 20 is what's called the lower quartile. That's the student that came in the 25th uh, percent place, the quarter place in the class. The median is the 50th percent. And 35 here is the upper quartile, which is the 75th percent. OK, so let's just think clearly what this means here. Say the lower quartile person. There, if you rank the class from lowest score to highest score, they came a quarter of the way along. OK, so that's what the lower quartile means. Now, the median means that they came exactly half the way between the lower and the They were the middle person in the class. They were 50th percent in the class. OK, so that means that 50% of people did better than them and 50% roughly, I know apart from the person in the middle, did worse. What does the lower quartile mean? It means that 75% did better than them and 25% did worse. So if 60% of the students passed, where would that person be on the list? Let's redraw this here. If this is the lowest person, this is the highest person, and we said let's just put in the lower quartile for now, the lower quartile tells me that 75% did better than them, and only 25% did worse. Where would the 60% uh, of the students pass mark, where would that be on here? Well, hopefully you could see that actually it would be here, around here, it would be at the 40th percent because this at this point 60 percent did better i.e. 60 percent passed and 40 percent failed so we're looking for the 40th percentile here so 60 percent we are looking for this will get your mark 40th percentile okay which is between the 25th percentile and the 50th. So we're looking for some number between there. Now let's draw out a box to represent this. This makes life a whole lot easier. The lower quartile, which is here, is 20. And that's the 25th percent. This one here. This is what I'm highlighting here. And we know the median is 30 and it's 50%. Now we're looking for the 40th percentile. The 40th percentile is going to be somewhere here. Okay, so how are we going to find the 40th percentile? Well, it's just sharing this bar of 10 up in this ratio. So we are, how far into the bar do we want to go? We want to go 15, 15 into the bar out of a total of 25, so 15 out of 25, and how much that distance do we want? Multiplied by 10. Okay, and you can just cancel fractions here and work this out. Um, this would simply, you could simplify that fraction here into three over five, and therefore you would get six. Because three times 10 is 30 over five times one is five, you get six. So you want to go six in, so therefore you want to go 20 plus six, which is 26 marks. So 26 marks would be my estimate for the 40th percentile, 26 marks. And then you'd be done for that question. So fairly tricky, but not too bad if you just think about it. And the last question, um, six marks here, it's actually very straightforward. Let's just make sure we read the question right and do the one like this correct. A rectangle has width 2x plus 1. 2x plus 1 is written there. Because it's a rectangle, let's write 2x plus 1 here. Why not? And uh, it tells us that the perimeter is 2 5x uh, multiplied by 5x plus 3. And it says the area is 26 centimetres squared. Work out the value of x. 
Now, obviously, we don't know this length here or this width. We're not told that, but we can work it out from the perimeter. We know the perimeter is 2, 5x plus 3, which, if we expand it out, is 10x plus 6. OK, but on the other hand, <coughs> if we call this length here, uh, let's call this uh, y, actually, we, uh, we could call that y. In the other hand, the perimeter would be 2y plus two of these added together, which would be 4x plus 2. So these two must be equal. So 10x plus 6 must be 2y plus 4x plus 2. And then you could just um, um, subtract the 4x and subtract the 2 off both sides. So you get 6x plus uh, 4 is equal to 2y. So 1y must be half that is 3x plus 2. So therefore, this here is now 3x plus 2. OK? And we are asked to work out the value of x. We know the area is 26, so you can multiply 2x plus 1, the height, times the width, 3x plus 2, and you know you should get the answer 26. Let's expand that out. 2x times 3x is 6x squared. 2x times 2 is 4x. 1 times 3x is 3x. 1 times 2 is 2. You can't solve a quadratic until you make one side 0, so subtract 26 of both sides. 6x squared, you could combine these as well, plus 7x. Then you'd have 2, subtract 26 would be um, negative 24 is equal to 0. Now, we have to solve a quadratic. Um, we can't really use the quadratic formula. You could. Um, you could use the quadratic formula x square, uh, x is negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a and substitute in. But the numbers are quite big and it's going to be hard calculations. It's a non-calculator paper. So you're probably expected to factorise. Now, 6x squared plus 7x subtract 24. We're trying to factorise that. Okay. So the first thing we do is we multiply the 6 by the negative 24. 6 multiplied by negative 24. Well, 6 times 20 is 120, 6 times 4 is 24, so that would be negative 144, right? So we think to ourselves, what numbers multiply to negative 144 and adds up to um, 7 here? Now, can you think of numbers that multiply to 144 and add to 7? So 9 and 16 multiply to 144, and what about 16 and negative 9? They add to 7 and they multiply to negative 144. So in this bracket would go a 6x, a 6x, and you'd put a plus 16 and a subtract 9. And then you cancel where appropriate. This could be divided by 2 and it would be 3x plus 8. And this one could be divided by 3 and it would be 2x subtract 3. That is your now factorised version that is equal to 0. These won't equal 0, that is equal to 0. So therefore 3x plus 8 equals 0 or 2x subtract 3 is 0 and therefore x is equal to negative 8 over 3 and x is equal to 3 over 2 and you ignore this one because it's a negative x if you go up here and stick a negative x in one of these ones you would get a negative length which doesn't make any sense we're dealing with rectangles so ignore that so x must be 3 over 2 or 1.5 is your answer. And were we dealing in centimetres? Yes, we were, so don't forget your units, centimetres. And that's it, you're done. Thank you for watching.